If your job sucks, just remember that the stakes are low. Chances are, messing up at work means working through lunch or being tepidly grilled in an HR meeting by a snidey stickler. It won't mean being dragged into a dank dungeon, tortured, and, if you're lucky, publicly executed. But for court jesters, bombing on stage was only the start of their troubles. On the plus side, the benefits were out of this world. We're talking wealth, comfort, and respect, plus a snazzy outfit. After all, how many jobs allow you to insult your country's ruler directly to their face? All you had to do was make sure each joke lands. But if you've ever been dragged to watch your brother-in-law's five-minute open mic set, then you know that comedy is a lot harder than it looks. Jester is no longer a viable job description, yet the skill set and role has manifested into other areas and functions of society, as have the consequences. They say dissecting a joke is like dissecting a frog. You might learn something, but the frog dies. With that in mind, it's time to learn how history works as we examine the evolution of jesters, the worst, best job in history. Chapter 1, The Setup. When you hear the word jester, you probably think of guys in medieval Europe wearing pointed shoes adorned with bells, but the origins can be traced right back to ancient civilizations like Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Some of the first accounts date right back to the 5th dynasty of Egypt with the pharaohs who ruled from the early 25th century. But their hired fools were pygmies. These were people who lived in the mysterious south, aka land of the ghosts, and were known to be short in stature. They were employed to dance and entertain, but there's no record of an observable comedy routine etched into a stone tablet, so it seems like it would still take time before jokes appeared, at least in the conventional sense that we understand them. Instead, the closest thing we have to documentation about a performer is dated to the 6th dynasty when an official wrote to the pharaoh Neferkare that he found a dancing dwarf called Danga. The ruler was delighted and immediately wrote back to the official, pleading with him to bring his humorous little person so he could see their jig in the court of Dadkariasi. It might not sound funny to us, but I guess you just had to be there. Still, it would take time for an official job title to emerge. The ancient Mesopotamians had the word aluzinu, which historians believe is the closest thing to the contemporary concept of jester or comedian. But they also had the word musihu meaning clown, or he who brings to laugh. Similarly, China's King Zhuang of Chu had his own proto-jester. During his reign between 613 and 591 BC, a Yu was someone who used humor to mock and joke. It was understood that no offense to be taken so long as their earnest criticism be funny. Likewise, Greece looked for someone to illuminate unspeakable truths with comedy. But often, actors from comedies were thrown into the spotlight. And the thing about actors is they can act, but they can't write. As for ancient Rome, some wealthy households had their own fool. But this wasn't a guy who sat in your corner telling knock-knock jokes. This would be a guy who was, shall we say, not right in the head. Nowadays, your rich neighbors will brag about getting the latest Tesla or a fridge that connects to Wi-Fi. Back then, yuppies bragged about the drooling buffoon they picked up at the boutique next to the slave auction. But it wasn't just private homes that were interested in a private yuckster. Businesses saw the virtue in having a comedian lighten the atmosphere. They'd be seen at markets and even brothels. Personally, that sounds a little distracting. Of course, as much as early man seemed to want to find a way to internationalize comedy, we all know the real history of jesters started with medieval Europe. That's because the height of being a professional fool is tied with the arrival of the Dark Ages. This week's lesson was sponsored by Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that is revolutionizing the landscape of men's grooming. Manscaped provides top-notch quality and unmatched value to the discerning gen with their latest grooming and hygiene bundle, the Perfect Package 5.0 featuring their all-new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Electric Trimmer. They have packed this kit full of snazzy new technology to take grooming precision to a whole new level. Their next-gen dual skin-safe blade heads now accompanied by an upgraded trimmer blade and interchangeable foil blade for enhanced performance. The upgraded trimmer blade features longer, wider, and rounded teeth to cut through hair with ease. Tough on hair, yet incredibly gentle on the skin. Using it is a cinch. Start your trimming session using the trimmer blade, then easily pop it off to attach the foil blade to get down to the skin level. The Lawnmower 5.0 is chock full of new features while keeping your favorites from previous versions, including a rechargeable lithium ion battery, RPM technology for top notch performance, a travel lock for seamless portability, USB C charging, a comprehensive three level battery life indicator, and the best part, it's still waterproof. When you buy the perfect package, you'll receive a crop soother and crop preserver perfect for pampering your delicate areas and making sure they smell positively splendid. Join the 9 million men worldwide who put their confidence in Manscaped for all their grooming and hygiene. 
head over to manscaped.com and get your hands on the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra today. When you use my promo code HISTORYWORKS, you'll get 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus a free gift. Chapter 2. The Punchline Roland and Farter might sound like a high school nickname, but it was actually the stage name for the jester of King Henry II of Britain. His sphincter manipulation was so impressive that he was gifted a manor in Suffolk with 30 acres of land, though some estimations say that his trouser music earned him 99 acres. All he had to do to maintain his luxurious lifestyle was an annual performance during the King's Christmas celebration. Every year, Roland would turn up, jump, whistle, and fart. It was hardly Cirque du Soleil, but the pressure of losing his livelihood must have been immense. It should be noted that Roland's <clears throat> skills were an exception. Usually, a jester was more a circus clown or a bard. They played music and sang, they juggled, they told stories, and performed magic tricks and acrobatic routines. During this time, jesters were expected to have multiple roles like offering counsel to rulers and even confidants. This was because their privilege to speak freely afforded them unconventional insights. After all, joke writing is interested in paradoxes and subversion, which makes them perfect for sniffing out hypocrisy. No doubt, this was a valuable tool for any leader seeking to maintain a balance of power between institutions, servants, and rivals. If you've seen Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones, you've got an idea of the value they had. Just imagine Peter Dinklage in goofy costumes and occasionally doing cartwheels. According to journalist Richard Boston in his book The Anatomy of Laughter, jesters are like the Joker in a deck of cards. Neither suit nor number, yet they can become the strongest card in the pack. Whereas an absolute monarch represents authority, a jester represents lawlessness. They can be nothing or everything. They are wild. They are political antimatter. It can be argued that the institutionalization of jesters into the political machine is the sign of a developing civilization. But getting too comfortable with mocking a king or queen could be fatal. Take Nicholas Ferriol, otherwise known as Tribolet. He was a 16th century court jester to the kings of France, Louis XII, and Francis I. He started as a low-level jester, but rose the ranks to become a fully-fledged court clown by 24. Apparently, the thing that nabbed him a promotion was ceasing to be an idiotic imbecile, and instead becoming a crafty, witty buffoon. Think of it like changing his act from Mr. Bean to Blackadder. Once he told the king that a nobleman was threatening to beat him, the great Tribolet, the king responded that if the nobleman did attack his court jester, then the king could easily beat the attacker to death within 15 minutes. Tribolet replied, that's great, but can't you do it 15 minutes earlier? So witty he was that he inspired characters within the works of legendary writer Victor Hugo centuries later. His silver tongue even saved his life. Once, he slapped the King Francis I on his derriere, but instead of an applause from the courtiers, the monarch turned to him and threatened to have him executed unless the jester could come up with an apology that was even more offensive than his actions. In response, Tribolet said, Sorry, I didn't recognize you, your majesty. I mistook you for the queen. As far as heckler put-downs go, that's not so bad. Unfortunately, the king's wife was off-limits, so Tribolet was ordered to death. However, the king rewarded his fool's year-long servitude by letting him choose the manner of death. Tribolet's response? I choose to die from old age. Well, it was funny enough for the king to call off the execution, and instead banish the jokester. Talk about a tough crowd. Then again, things would have been worse had Tribolet not been a clown of the Renaissance. Chapter 3. The Topper As the medieval period shifted into the Renaissance, jesters reached their peak. The spark of interest in more serious matters saw the style of jesters change from stupidity to being more serious about being unserious. After all, this was a period of art, literature, science, and culture. Political intrigue dominated dinner table conversation. There was no market for Roland the Farter during these times of sophistication. <laughs> jesters were still expected to sing and dance and play music at banquets. But the expectations for witty banter and satire during intimate gatherings replaced the needs for foolishness. The clothing changed to reflect this too. Gradually, the garish colors and ridiculous outfits were refined into more acceptable eccentricities. Case in point, Archibald Armstrong. That was his real name, by the way, not a stage name. The 17th century native of Cumberland first earned himself a reputation for stealing sheep before, somehow, being hired as a jester by then King James VI. According to historians, his sharp mind and acid tongue made him a favorite of the court, soon earning him silk clothes and a handsome salary. He joined the king at weddings, tours, and diplomatic missions. 
Though his success went to his head, his pompousness didn't stop him from becoming recognized as a quintessential Renaissance jester. Though his smugness did get him unceremoniously ejected from the court of Charles I for an all-timed jibe about religion. It seemed the king wasn't the only one getting tired of jesters. When the Enlightenment rolled around, the pursuits in rationality and science left little room for people to be silly. Now, humor was seen as irrelevant and disrespectful. It was at odds with the emergence of decorum, and other societal expectations regarding honor, decency, and politeness. Farting may have been the big thing in medieval times, but tastes had changed. Mocking authority figures was frowned upon, even with the decline of monarchies across Europe. Without kings or queens to place jesters in positions of influence, there was no one else to give the royal credence. Even monarchies that became constitutional monarchies dropped their royal courts, which further reduced the demand for a qualified fool. Add to this the rise of censorship and controlling governments and institutions, and you've got the lifeblood of the comedian cut off at the source. No longer could jesters create biting and social political commentary without being thrown in jail or spurned from high society. The best a jester could do was take to the streets. But their reliance on acts like juggling and acrobatics would be dealt another blow when the 19th century hit. Circuses, music halls, and even the movies were pretty much the final nail in the coffin. Now, there were other places to see daring feats without hearing jokes, and places to hear jokes without seeing daring feats. A jester skill set could be divided up and spread across vibrant new entertainment with its formidable industry. A simple street juggler couldn't compete. It was well and truly over for the jester, at least when it came to the job title and funny costumes, because, as we'll see, the 20th century was a time that needed laughter. Chapter 4 the reversal. The 20th century wasn't that fun. There was war, revolution, genocide, and all-around misery, especially if you were living under a dictator who infamously can't take a joke. Yet the emergence of Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia did see a re-emergence in the jester, kind of. Cabarets became the place to see jokes intertwined with physical performance. Though jesters were no longer performing in royal courts, a public stage became the right place to get back into the swing of things. Take the Berlin cabaret artist Werner Fink. One of his performances ridiculed Hitler with the same precision as Trubelet's crack about the Queen's behind. When a Nazi decree demanded that pictures of the Fuhrer be hung in all government offices, Fink and his cohorts took the stage carrying a giant picture frame, making sure the audience could only see the back of it. Of course, everyone knew what the picture represented. So when Fink warned his co-star to be careful with the unwieldy portrait and not to topple, the public had witnessed a blazing dig on the German dictator with enough plausible deniability to spare Fink a trip to the gallows. The school of Nazi ridicule peaked with Charlie Chaplin's The Dictator, arguably the cinematic equivalent of a jester, but with his inventive slapstick and acrobatic skill. But in case you're still skeptical about the correlation between dark times and pratfalls, it's worth knowing that Josef Goebbels, Hitler's right-hand man of propaganda, banned slapstick movies outright. Not that he was the only one to detest practical jokes. Decades later, when the USSR had spread over the globe, protesters invoked the tried and tested methods of the jester to stage ingenious resistance. They were called the Orange Alternative, an anti-communist underground movement led by Waldemar Fidrich. Friedrich was born in 1953 Poland and earned the nickname Major when he dodged the military service with an elaborate act. He turned up to the Communist Commission dressed in a military commander's outfit while expressing red-hot zeal to join the forces. The conscription officials were so put off by his display of dedication that they ruled him mentally unfit to participate in the front line. But that was just the start for Orange Alternative. They were a group of pranksters whose motto was, there is no freedom without dwarves. If you're trying to figure out what it means, then you're missing the joke. The movement lacked any ideological motive and instead focused on mocking absurdities with what they named happenings. These avant-garde installations included people lining up each with a letter on their shirt which, when lined up correctly, spelled out the name of a popular drink. The DNA from staging these impromptu mass gatherings and strange artistic installations can be seen in the flash mob craze of the early thousands and even the Just Stop oil protesters as well as internet pranksters who troll protests. Now, it seems anyone can be a jester, and any stage can be a royal court, which brings us neatly to the final evolution of the jester. Chapter 5 – The In-Joke We've all seen how stand-up comedy has become a fully-fledged craft and industry. And we've all seen how funny men go from talk show hosts to respected journalist and author, so it was inevitable that comedians would gravitate towards areas of authority as time went on. But not many people predicted that a jester would eventually become king. Love him or loathe him, Trump has signaled a shift in world politics that's as seismic as the transition from the Dark Ages to the Enlightenment. This guy is a one-man meme factory. 
Whether it's because he's a professional idiot or just an idiot doesn't seem to matter. He's proved that the old way to do things is over. Before, publicly dissing a citizen was a surefire way to end your political career. But now, a dig at Rosie O'Donnell catapults you to the White House. But Trump wasn't the first politician to flirt with the jester archetype. Obama and Biden buddied up for short-term content, and Silvio Berlusconi was known for being a larger-than-life character. Even Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, prime minister of the United Kingdom, and architect of Brexit, spent years winning favor with the public with his buffoonery. How ironic. Jesters went from objects of mockery, tools of counsel, conduits of resistance, and finally being in charge. It seems after centuries of being a fool, jesters finally got the last laugh. Or are we kidding ourselves? Tell us whether you think Trump reignited the power of the jester. Of course, not all jesters made it out alive. And if you want to see why, make sure to check out our video on the history of getting cancelled. And don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.